Uh, Claire is Professor of the Practice at Harvard University. She's the 2012 MacArthur Fellow. She won the Avery Fisher Prize in 2017. She's the co-founder of the International Contemporary Ensemble in New York. And that's just a selection uh, of uh, the things that she's achieved and done, which I think really demonstrate how she is a musician that crosses so many areas. Uh, from, for instance, uh, at this year's BBC Prom, she's um, playing flute concertos she commissioned from Olga Neuberg. From that sort of, you know, area of work to many, many projects that are profoundly participatory in nature. She's going to talk about some of that work tonight. I'm absolutely thrilled that she's here to work with the, um, as part of the Composing Women's Program. And there are a couple of other events this week connected to that. There's, I'll just advertise that. Uh, a lunchtime concert on Wednesday at 12 o'clock in the hall next door, beside the Hall East, uh, where we have a, an informal showing of four works by Bree Van Rijk, Peggy Colias, Josie Magnus, and Georgia Scott. And then there's also an open workshop in the afternoon led by Claire, uh, which I think will be very interesting for, um, for you and, and many people, which is about um, forming communities and, and uh, building contemporary music projects. Claire, it's over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I can't believe I made it down under. <laughs> um, I'm also so looking forward to working with the extraordinary young women in, in the Composing Women project tomorrow. I've loved getting to know them over Skype over the last few weeks and uh, I'm really excited to dive into their pieces and thank you Lisa for your invitation for making this possible and also for your extraordinary vision in creating the Composing Women project <laughs> and, and all of you thank you so much um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my project Density 2036 which um, in a nutshell is a is a multi-decade project that will take me and my musical family my expanding musical family uh, into the future, into the year 2036, which will be the centennial of this little ditty for solo flute, Edgar Varese's groundbreaking 1936 solo, which for me was, was really a before and after moment for the flute literature, for the flute, its identity, but also um, for the identity of the solo performer. It was a piece that, that took a simple form, <laughs> four minutes of solo flute music, and blew it completely open and, uh, and, and for me, really reimagined, redefined what the expressive and dramatic capacities of this little tube of metal could be. Um, so the project is simultaneously a commitment to creating a new body of repertory. So it's a commitment to commissioning uh, a new program of music each year. It's also an exploration of new performance practices, not just for the flute, but new performance practices in, in contemporary solo music in general. And it's also an inherently collaborative exploration. You know, it's a solo project, but I don't do this alone at all. It's collaborative in the sense that I'm working with composers, but also with, with sound artists, with sound engineers, with acousticians, instrument builders, in some cases, directors, designers, um, choreographers, filmmakers. And it also is becoming, um, this is the fifth year of the project, and it's, it's now becoming a, a kind of living library and archive of scores and performance materials and videos and structural information, anything that a future generation of flute players would need to take this repertoire and make their own and push it even further into the future, further than I can. So the nuts and bolts of the, of the project, I, I commission, premiere and record a new cycle of music, usually between 60 and 90 minutes each year. Uh, between 2013, the start of the project, and 2036, uh, the centennial of, of this little gem. And taken together, this, this will be a cumulative body that I imagine will be somewhere between 24 and 30 hours of music. And I'm planning on playing the entire thing in a day and a night in 2036. And I've been doing sort of marathon performances. It sounds um, incredibly presumptuous to call it a marathon when I'm looking towards doing a day and a night performance, but I did a six hour version of everything that had been written in the project to date a couple of months ago. And, and it, was, it was a fascinating experience, it was great fun. And um, you know, I do these 
these marathons and I'm imagining the marathon in 2036, you know, not as some kind of sporting event or to Marina Abramovich's contemporary flip performance, but, but really, for me, it's much simpler than that. It's, 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 the, it's the simplest and I think most direct manifestation of the goal of the project, which is to use the life and the body of the performer to necessarily ephemeral things in the service of a body of work that I hope will last much longer. And so to do that in a durational form is, for me, the most direct and honest way of saying, well, this is what has been created, this is what this body can do in this lifetime, and here it goes into, into the rest of, of the world and into the hands and ears and minds and imaginations of people who will be able to push it much, much farther than I can. So why the obsession with these two pages of music, you might ask, you know, why not do um, an anniversary project around Debussy or Bach or, or, or Boulez or Berio um, or any number of other great composers for the flute. And I, I have my own reasons, my personal reasons, but I like to let music speak for itself. So I'm just going to play density for you. And um, here she is.
for me, density is, um, it's not just a piece of solo flute music. It's a, it's a song, it's an anthem. And um, my personal backstory with the piece is that I came into my flute lesson when I was 13 years old and my teacher at the time, John Fonville, put these two pages of music on the music stand. And I looked at it and I thought, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen, you know? There's no licks, there's only one trill. What am I supposed to do with this? And, and there's notes that I don't know how to play and look at all these dynamics. He looks like such a control freak. And, uh, and my teacher said, you want to hear it? And I said, yes, I would love to hear it. And he said, okay, kiddo, stand back. <laughs> and, and so I stood back and for the next four and a half minutes, my, my imagination was just completely blown open. And I had never experienced the flute before as this, as this agent of power, brutality, but also lyricism and, and beauty uh, in, in, a, in a not incidental and pretty way, but beauty in a, in a raw and forceful and, um, and unapologetic way, the way that a brass instrument or the way that a human voice is so easily understood and the flute is um, less understood as such. So it completely blew the roof off of my adolescent imagination. I became utterly obsessed with the piece and I practiced this and only this, my poor parents. Uh, I had braces and I couldn't hit the high Ds and you know I would make the neighborhood dogs go crazy. And um, when I was asked to play something for my junior high school graduation, and this was in a public school in Southern California where the cultural priorities were basically surfing and football, uh, I said I was going to play density. And um, my proposal was shot down, unfortunately, uh, not by the school officials because they didn't know who Edgar Varese was, but by my parents uh, <laughs> who'd been tortured by this for long enough. And, and, uh, and I was made to play Danny Boy instead. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to program it, I should say, because I thought it was so strange, because I thought it would be abrasive. I actually genuinely wanted to play this on a football field in Southern California for a thousand adolescents <laughs> who just wanted to get to their party, because I thought that it would possibly change some of them the way that it changed me. I really did want to share it, and I wanted to play it in a stadium. So that didn't end up happening. But for those of you parents in the room, you know that if you have an adolescent, the surest way to get them to do anything is to tell them not to do it. So my not being able to play density for my junior high school graduation only stoked the fire that I, that I had for, for this piece and for Edgar Varese and everything that, um, that he represented. So that's my story with density. So essentially, the project um, is a, is a, it's, it's, it's less a devotional um, project to the piece and more a devotional project and idea to the notion of creating something that is beyond what we know and something that pushes the instrument and pushes the performer beyond what they know, pushes the listener beyond what they know. So I'm going to share with you just a, a, a few things that have been created in the cycle so far. Um, the first is, is a piece that I'll be playing at the Backstage Sydney concert on, on Friday night by the wonderful, wonderful composer Suzanne Farron. And Suzanne is a, is a brilliant Ond Martineau player as well as, uh, as, well as a composer. And um, Varese, of course, was very fond of the, of the Ond Martineau. I, when I think of Varese and I think of the Ond Martineau, and often when I think about this piece too, I, I think of what uh, Borges said of Kafka, that he was so influential that he influenced even the people who came before him. <laughs> and so, of course, you know, Varese influenced Berio and uh, Boulez and Sariaho and Sharino and all, all of the great, and all of us in this room, right? Uh, Varese has influenced all of us. But I also like to think sort of ancestrally of Varese having influenced Debussy and Ravel and perhaps even Bach. Um, so the Onde Martineau always takes me back into, into that way of thinking about past, present, and future. So Suzanne wrote this wonderful, wonderful piece called The Stimulus of Loss. And it's based on an Emily Dickinson poem. It's actually a letter poem that she wrote to Susan Dickinson, her next door neighbor, her sister-in-law, and her lover. Uh, and in it, she says to Susan, she says, Dear Sue, to miss you is power. The stimulus of loss makes most possession mean. Indemnity for loneliness that such a bliss has been. And, and so the setting of the Onde Martineau 
And this bizarre looking instrument, which is a glissando flute, and it enables me to glissando over the entire range of the instrument, just like a trombone or a violin or a human voice. Um, capacities that we flute players have not had until, until quite recently. Um, is, a, is to me, this, the setting of these two instruments is such a beautiful manifestation of this correspondence between these two women and, and the idea of, of loss and gain. So I'll play you just a couple of short excerpts. If you come to the show on, on uh, Friday, you'll hear the whole thing. But um, this is just a couple of, of my favorite fragments. section where the piece really, really blooms. This is, this is for me the line, indemnity for loneliness that such a bliss has been. Oops. Since I get to make up the rules, I'll make the rules really simple. <laughs> in that there's a new cycle every year, we do it until 2036. I perform and record each of the cycles each year. 
And my rule for myself and my collaborators is that anything goes as long as it's a total departure stylistically, as much as possible energetically, aesthetically, and technically than what I'd done in the previous cycles. So this really is a challenge for me as a player, it's a challenge for, for the composer and for my other collaborators to, to take what has been written and um, absorb it if, if, if we wish, but depart from it. Um, so I've, I've never um, prescribed for a composer, well, you need to look at density 21.5. In a few cases, composers have asked me to, to play it for them, um, but the project isn't, isn't about that piece as much as it is about the spirit of the piece and the spirit of exploration, discovery, and otherness, and beyond the instrument. Um, so I really love what Suzanne did, did with it, um, and with this very old and very new instrument. Electronics have um, been a large part of, of the cycle. I say solo flute, but uh, since I'm making up the rules, that's also been very liberal. Um, there have been many pieces for, for flute and electronics. Um, I've also done a complete cycle that was uh, collaborations with composer, performer, improvisers. Um, and in the last cycle, as I'll talk about a little bit, um, a bit later, I have also started to conceive of solo flute music as in collaboration with the audience and actually engaging the entire audience in the act of making and performing the piece with me. So again, we're making up the rules. But electronics, uh, for the first few years of the cycle, was a really huge part of it. And um, one of the people, one of the composers who opened up my mind so much to, to the world of electronics is this extraordinary man, George Lewis, um, pioneer of electronic music, historical musicologist who's an encyclopedic knowledge of uh, so many different subjects. He's one of my heroes was uh, involved in the, in the early days as a, as a 15, 16 year old in Chicago of the inception of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians. And um, as an activist and as a scholar and teacher and just extraordinary human being, he's, he's one, of my, one of my heroes. So that he accepted my invitation to write a piece was, was a really great honor. And um, since it involves live electronics, I'm not gonna play it live for you, but I'll play you just a, a short little excerpt. And I'll, I'll point out where we're gonna start. It's sort of halfway through uh, that first system. This is a piece called Emergent for, for flute and live electronics. And this is with, with George manipulating the electronics himself. So it is, in essence, it is a duo. by George. I mean, speaking of musical uh, ancestral lineage, um, George has influenced so many young composers and particularly composers who are working with live electronics or designing their own instruments. And one of them who hasn't been his direct student but who's been very much influenced by his work is this young woman that you see on the screen here, Pauchi Sasaki. She's Japanese-Peruvian and uh, she is a composer, she's an improviser, she's a virtuoso violinist. She's also a sound designer and instrument builder, um, and she does everything herself. She is more and more becoming a director and uh, and a kind of a kind of mastermind of of sonic and visual experiences that we don't really have a name for yet. Um, but she's also truly extraordinary in that she builds everything that she works with. She doesn't work with an engineer who builds things for her, and so she's been working on a series of dresses made entirely out of speakers. And so what you see here um, is her first dress that she built for herself that is made of 94 speakers. So essentially, this tiny woman is wearing her own very, very powerful sound system. Uh, and so I commissioned her as part of this piece to create a, a dress that could be a dual partner with her dress. And mine has 133 speakers. 
um, and uh, that little backpack that you see in the back there. So all, that's all the all the innards, all the cords. <laughs> I have a little purse that has um, that has all of my uh, everything a lady needs in it. Um, and so the piece, uh, the score. Um, well, I'll just show a couple other sh shots of of these dresses. They're really they're really something. Um, the piece, the score basically looks like this. And the score is the electronic patch and it's also a map that she and I follow. Um, it's a stage map and, um, and a map of sort of emotional trajectories that we go through and certain sound cues that we give each other. Uh, it was the first piece that I did that, that required me to be away from the instrument actually for about 80% of the piece. A lot of it is playing flute-like techniques but outside of, of the flute and having them processed through, through the dresses. Um, so this is what a map looked like. We did this a few weeks ago in, um, in Disney Hall in LA, and this is what our, our map through the space looked like. We entered through the back of the auditorium and ambled down um, with our portable sound systems and ended up on stage. Here's what that looks like with the, uh, with the organ lit up. <laughs> um, so, you know, pieces that have electronics in the cycle have, have uh, they've ranged from the George Lewis's of the world to, to the new and, um, and, and incredibly exciting and incredibly different worlds of somebody like Pauci. Um, I've also had the extraordinary opportunity to work with, with this man, Taishan Sori. Is this a name that's familiar here in, Taishan will definitely, definitely go home and YouTube Taishan Sori because he is, in the words of my colleague Vijay Iyer, he's the future of music. Taishan is, is quite possibly the most outrageously talented person I've ever uh, had the privilege of making music with. He's a multi-instrumentalist, pianist, uh, percussionist, trombonist, unbelievable improviser, unbelievable composer and orchestrator, and, uh, and just a wonderful collaborative partner as well. And Taishan was, was famous for saying, um, when he was asked once, how do you deftly meld the worlds of notation and free improvised music? And he looked at the, at the interviewer who asked the question and he said, I don't know how to answer that question because I make music and I write music from a place at which those lines have already ceased to exist. He sees the world of notation, the world of improvisation, the world of le electronic music, the world of acoustic music. He sees this as utterly integrated. And, and so Taishan's scores, in, in the case of the score that he wrote for me, this is what one page of it looks like. This is what another page of it looks like. And he navigates so freely between these worlds. It was, it was a, a extraordinary lesson for me in, in working with him. This is a duo, I should say, that he wrote for us. It started as a solo, but as is often the case with density pieces, I get into the studio with composers and we just let the piece lead us. <laughs> and often the instrumentation changes or often the concept changes. Um, so, so Taishan's pivoting between these two worlds is, um, is totally virtuoso and, and it was the first piece in the, in the cycle, you know, Pauci's piece dealt with improvisation, um, but it was very much connected to this instrument and the garment it, itself was making so much music. But this is the first time that I was on stage for, for 20 minutes, um, actually creating much of the piece with my collaborator. So I'll play you just a, a short excerpt of this. It's a piece called Bertha's Lair. Bertha is the, is the name that was affectionately given by Pauline Oliveros and her partner Ion to my contrabass flute when I brought my contrabass flute to um, meet her <laughs> because Pauline was writing a piece for me as well and, and she looked at it and she said, that's not Dora, which was the name of the instrument at the time, that's Bertha, that's Big Bertha. And so from that moment on, the instrument was called Big Bertha. Tashan loved this and so he wrote a piece for Bertha called Bertha's Lair and it's dedicated to Pauline, and here's just a little excerpt. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
I also worked that same year, um, this was the, the third year of the density cycle, with Du Yun. Du Yun, perhaps is a familiar name here? Um, great, it's good to know that these folks are making it over. Um, you know, so much of the project has, has been about working with, with composers who are in my generation who are not necessarily um, well known yet. I've worked with people like George Lewis and, and Pauline Oliveros and folks that are for contemporary music um, aficionados household names, but I'm also really, really excited about working with people that no one has ever heard of before and, um, and making pieces with them. So Duyan um, wrote a wonderful piece for me for bass flute and, and electronics. And uh, I'll be playing it also on, on Friday on the recital, but I thought I would play just a couple of, of excerpts for you. It's called An Empty Garlic, and uh, the title comes from a Rumi poem of the same name. And you know, we associate Rumi with love poetry and poetry of redemption and spirituality. And, um, and this poem has all of that, but it also has a dark and melancholy side um, that we don't often associate with Rumi. Um, I think it's one of the reasons this poem is, is little known. And um, I'll just, I'll, I'll recite a bit of it for you so you get a sense for the mood and, and um, emotional space of the piece. It's devastating for the first section and then the last stanza is I think one of the most beautiful things that he ever wrote. So it goes like this. You miss the garden because you're looking for a small fig from a random tree. You don't meet the beautiful woman you're joking with an old crone. It makes me cry how she detains you, stinking mouthed with a hundred talons, putting her head over the roof's edge to crawl down. Tasteless fig, full, overfold, empty as dry, rotten garlic. She has you by the belt, even though there's no milk and no flour inside her body. Death will open your eyes to what her face is black spine of a leather lizard. No more advice. Let yourself be silently drawn by the stronger pull of what you really love. Isn't that gorgeous? After all of that. <laughs> and so the piece is totally tumultuous and grasping and devastating for the first section of it. And then we have this series of Sarabans um, and Sarabande-esque things that, that Du Yun wrote. Um, and the Saraband was, of course, a form that was, that was um, popularized in 16th century Spain, and it was outlawed for a while because it was so sexy. And, um, and uh, several priests decided that it was dangerous, and therefore it should be outlawed as a, as a form. So it's a period of about 50 years where it was not allowed to be played. But it survived, and it traveled to other, other countries, and, uh, and of course, when J.S. Bach took it up, it became the most, one of the most sacred forms. So Duyan plays a lot with Sarah Bonds in this piece, and she also played with a, a, a 15th, uh, sorry, 5th century hymn um, of venerable Xenia of Rome. Does anybody know about Xenia of Rome? Fantastic, fantastic story of a woman uh, who courageously left her, left her town and her parents and an arranged marriage and fled to a Greek island um, where she became a healer and a spiritual leader and was welcomed by a totally new community. Um, and so this is a little hymn to her. And I'm going to play just a tiny excerpt of it for you. This comes at about um, three quarters of the way through the piece. So we're nearing our way to that last resplendent stanza.
Sarabande, the famous Bach um, A minor partita Sarabande, at the very end of the piece and sets it in the most unusual way, this uh, passage starting at 194. She has the flute play the beginning of that Sarabande. <laughs> Somehow, density just finds its way into every single one of these pieces. Uh, so this is just the last two stanzas from because I, I know it's of interest to, to the four young composers that I'm working with this week, is a piece by Jason Eckhart called The Silenced. And I'll just show you the, the first page of the score. This was, I mean, I feel like I say this about all density pieces, but there are certain pieces in the cycle that have really, really pushed me, just completely made me redefine my relationship with the instrument and with my body um, and with the form. And, um, they all do that, but, but this piece in, in particular really, really pushed me. Um, the piece is it's called The Silenced, and it is, in Jay's words, a meditation on those who have been silenced, who have been muted either by political or economic, uh, for, for political or economic or social circumstances, and yet struggle to be heard. And, and so the piece was also inspired by a performance, extraordinary performance, that Billy Whitelaw, the actress, did of Samuel Beckett's Not I. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, with Not I, the play. It's one of, one of Beckett's most astounding works. And Whitelaw's performance of it, which Beckett worked on, um, Whitelaw tells these stories of, of uh, coming out of a six hour rehearsal with him and then going and getting dinner in the middle of dinner, Beckett continuing. <laughs> to coach her on her lines in between bites of things and sips of things. Um, and so the, the collaborative relationship, which was a very demanding one, but also a very loving one, um, I think reminded Jay a lot of his, his collaborative relationship with me and, and with some of his closest performer collaborators. So what I did was just mashed up two short videos, um, first of the, of the Beckett, of Whitelaw performing the Beckett, and then a few excerpts of, of, the, of the Eckhart. So um, this is... Back at first and then back art. Oops. Lovers are normally vented at the speechless infant in the home. No, out into this world, this world. Tiny little thing before his time in a godfather. What? Girl, yes, tiny little girl. Into this, out into this, before her time. Godforsaken hole called, called. No matter, parents unknown, unheard of, he having vanished, thin air, no sooner button of his breeches, she similarly, eight months later, almost at the tick, so no love spared that. No love such as normally vented on the speechless infant in the home. No, nor indeed for that matter, any of any kind, no love of any kind, at any subsequent stage. So, typical affair, nothing of any note till coming up to sixty when, what? Seventy? God! Coming up to seventy when, wandering in a field, looking aimlessly for cowslips to make a ball, a few steps then stop, stare into space, then on, a few more, stop 
happens there again, so on, drifting around, when suddenly, gradually, all went out, all that early April morning light, and she found herself in the... What? Who? No! She! And so this is what the notation looks like. Um, one of the most challenging and, and I would say also most rewarding things that I have taken on in, in the cycle. Um, and you know, often people ask me, <laughs> what's it like to collaborate with composers? I mean, how do these conversations go? And we talked about this a bit when, when I Skyped with, um, with the composers here at the con, but the truth is that it's like any relationship, it's totally different every, every, every person. And it's also different every day with the same two people. Um, and so I, I, I like to spend a lot of time with composers that I'm working with and talk to them about everything, including things that are not music. But when that's not possible and we have oceans between us, you know, we do have technology. And so my friend Dai Fujikura, who, who wrote a piece for the cycle, um, he didn't tell me this, but he had actually been recording all of our Skype conversations, many of which I had in my pajamas and, you know, um, and, and he, he would record them and then play excerpts of them for his, his um, composition class, his orchestration class. So I discovered this years later and I was like, look, Di, this is so embarrassing, but at least you could, like, give me, give me some of the good stuff. Like, he's like, oh, okay, okay, I'm going to send you one. So he sent me this one minute. He said, this is, a, this is one of my favorite moments. So this is when he was in the very beginning stages of writing a, a piece for me that would become a flute concerto. And, uh, and, and this is us. His, you can hear his daughter screaming in the background. Oops first with other things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know like tongue rounds <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hi mina mm -hmm. and then okay. mm -hmm. can at any moment introduce actual pitches to that mm -hmm. texture yeah 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 and so, so those pitches should be any pitches it can be any pitches yeah mm -hmm. You can also alternate between, you know, <laughs> and then you add in some flutter, some, oh, yeah. you know, all that stuff. I see, I see. Okay, so. You know, 
know, about a week later, he sends me this. <laughs> Um, and, the, and the first, it, it was a flute concerto that also has a solo version that I did as part of Density. And, you know, the notation that we saw in Jason Eckhart's piece, which, in, in which he's, he's got every last inhalation, it's like every thought is notated. Um, and, I, and I love notation that's that detailed. Dai, you know, went for a similar texture, but he went, he, his notation in the, in, the, in the opening sequence here is just a series of boxes with a bunch of syllables that he wants me to basically just jam out on. And so it ends up sounding kind of something like this. Also depends on the day, but here's what will come out today. daughter screaming right there in the Skype session that sounds like this. <laughs> I was like, that's me now. <laughs> um, so one of the pieces that it, to me uh, was one of the greatest honors that I've had in, in the course of this project so far was a collaboration with the late great Pauline Oliveros. And um, Pauline wrote a piece for me called A Tribute to Grace. Grace was the the name of my grandmother, and Pauline is a grandmother figure for, for me in my life and for a lot of musicians. I mean, her, her influence over many, many generations of musicians is just, it, it can't be understated. Um, it can't be overstated, excuse me, jet lag. Uh, she, she wrote a piece for flute and flutist speaking, interacting with a system that she's been working on since 1965 called the Expanded Instrument System. And I was playing around with the system. It, 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 in her way of describing it, the EIS, the Expanded Instrument System, is like improvising with an extraterrestrial. It's like improvising with a, a human being that has virtuoso powers that are centuries beyond ours. It's evolutionarily in a completely different place. You play something into, into this patch and it spits back at you the most extraordinary response. It also remembers what you've done up to six hours later and continues improvising with it and embellishing on it. So we were messing around um, in a studio and she said, will you just pick a text, pick anything that you're reading and start reading it into, into the EIS. And so I had been reading a collection of my, of my late grandmother's poetry um, and uh, my grandmother was a, was a schizophrenic woman who medicated herself by reading and writing poetry every day of her life. And when she passed away, we found volumes and volumes of material. And I had always wanted to, to do something with it musically. Pauline was fascinated with this immediately and was fascinated also with the sounds of the words and the relationship to the electronic system and the, and the resultant music. So the score, you know, we've looked at a lot of different scores, different types of scores that are open form, that are fully notated, all kinds of um, things in between. This score is just text. So this is this is this was all all that I did, um, and so you you can see the in section one lines like Gaelic 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 things like that um, sound a bit like this in the context. When I was a child, I did thus. Now, as a child, I threw my eyes away. What's with me at the end?
So there's a, a, a short contrabass flute solo at the end of this monodrama, essentially, for, for speaker and the live improvisation with, uh, with the expanded instrument system. So the most recent piece in the cycle, um, the last thing that I'll talk about this evening, is, is a piece that's still in process by, by the composer Marcos Balter, um, and it's called Pan. It is, I mentioned that I very liberally um, define solo flute, and I really don't think of the flute as the flute alone. I think about it always in collaboration and in dialogue with other forces. And so the past cycle of, of density, um, this was density 2017, I wanted to think of the entire audience as part of the piece. And so Marcos and I created a piece in collaboration with the director, Doug Fitch, um, that tells the complicated, fraught, politically fraught, and, um, and dramatically fraught story of Pan, the mythological god of flute playing fame, and also Pan as in the combining form for all, um, as an investigation into what we could do if we created a work of art that was not just participatory in nature, but that asked the question, you know, could we make a piece of work that is as socially conscious in its making as it is in the, in the subject material that it addresses? And could we make a piece that is actually about building community by building that community, not by thinking of community building as an extra or an outreach thing that we do? And so the piece is scored for solo flute, live electronics, and mass community participation in the form of musicians, non-musicians, children, adults, people who've been on stage before, people who've never been on stage before. We really wanted to think of community in the way that the great Bell Hooks has challenged us to think about community. She, she says that, um, you know, often when we talk about community, we're talking about groups of like-minded people forming larger groups. And we need to be very, very wary of the danger of evoking something that we're not actually challenging ourselves to practice um, and building a community of people who are very different from one another, who look at the world differently, who have different practices, who come from different educational and other backgrounds um, is, a new, is a new kind of challenge and, and it was one that we really wanted to take on in this piece. So this is just a, a little shot of, um, of this was the, the sketch, the sort of idea of the piece. We have a mob and, and we have Pan here and this is what it actually looked like on stage. Um, and this was our map, I guess you could say. This was kind of our, our internal mission statement for the piece. Um, we really wanted to put the performer, the listener, and the composer on absolutely equal footing. We didn't want to think of this in a hierarchy at all. Um, and this is what the score looks like. So the, uh, the entire theater or, or space, um, we're interested in doing the piece in places that are not your typical theatrical settings um, is, is full of performers. So the audience is not really aware who's a performer and who's not. Um, and there's an onstage chorus you can see here in the middle of um, wine glasses, tuned wine glasses and tuned wine bottles, all manner of handheld percussion instruments. There's a children's choir, um, all notated, <laughs> but all achievable by a group of people who come to a week of rehearsals and they don't need to have any prior experience. So we created the piece in collaboration with this community center in Brooklyn called the Riseboro Youth and Senior Center. And uh, we created it in, in their gymnasium and spent Saturdays and Sunday afternoons there for, for many months with this extraordinary group of people. And it was, you know, as these pictures can show you, sort of a part community theater part contemporary opera, part contemporary performance, and all community building from the inside out. Um, these people, there's 65 of them, are now a part of my, not just musical family, but they're a part of my family. Um, and we got to know each other, I mean, playing basketball with them and going to their events and being in their space and, and uh, understanding their lives was a huge part of the, of the creation of the piece. And um, I'll play you just a couple of very short excerpts. I know we're, we've got just a few minutes left. Um, this is the opening scene of, of Pan, where, um, for those of you for, who are familiar with the myth, Pan was um, challenged to a duel, a musical duel, by Apollo, by the great god Apollo. And Pan thought very highly of himself and his flute playing skills and thought that he could beat a god and uh, Pan being a half-god and half-man, half-sheep, uh, 
did not do so well, did not fare so well in this challenge. And his punishment was to be flayed alive. So our production of Pan, the opera of Pan, actually begins with this public execution, essentially, in which Pan's skin is being peeled off and he is losing the ability to play. So this is just a little bit of an excerpt of that. looks like for that. And the notation for the, for the onstage and also offstage and in the audience participants, which we essentially thought of as like a Greek chorus, you know, a Greek orchestra and a chorus. And what would happen if your orchestra and your chorus were actually members of your neighborhood and community um, and not the hired band? Um, and also really happy to be there. Uh, so my notation you can see on the top, you know, looks like flute notation and, and the notation for the, for the, the onstage chorus and, and orchestra um, are simple little light cues that show pitch changes and timbre changes and dynamic changes. Um, and so this is what that sounds like, just a little tiny bit. <laughs> in full costume. Um, Pan is uh, a despicable creature in addition to being a flute virtuoso, and so you don't have to look far into history to find um, examples of power-hungry, manipulative, abusive men. <laughs> and, uh, and so for our story, we did a little bit of revisionist history. In the myth, Pan creates the Pan flute by killing Syrinx and by taking her voice and that becomes his instrument, and he becomes the master of that instrument. And we see all of the flutes descend, and we have after the pan flute, the piccolo, and the C flute, and the contrabass flute, they all come down from the ceiling in this production. And Pan, in the end, faces this duel and faces his, his, um, his demise. And in our story, we, we thought, well, it's Greek myth, so everything is made up anyway. We're going to bring Syrinx back and we're gonna give her a voice. And so we commissioned the poet Caroline Randall Williams to write an absolutely gorgeous text that, that Syrinx recites at the, in the penultimate moment of the piece um, that takes back her voice and actually takes back the pan flute. So the scene right before that, this is towards the end of the opera, um, I'll just give you a tiny taste. <laughs> So this is what the curtain call looked like. And I show this picture because this was totally a metaphor for the entire project. It was just beautiful chaos. <laughs> um, I learned so much from this group of people and I'm so excited to, to take this piece. We'll do it again in Chicago in, in another workshop format in, in uh, the fall. It's very much still in progress. Um, but the upcoming cycle of density um, just to give a little forecast. I actually haven't announced this anywhere, so this is the first. You're hearing it here for the first time. This will be in the 2018-2019 20, season. Are these three extraordinary women, 
Phyllis Chen, a wonderful toy pianist and performance artist and composer, Olga Neubert, and uh, Pamela Z. And I'm also really delighted to announce that in 19 or 20, <laughs> this amazing woman will be the next density composer. So I'm so looking forward to, well, to sharing some of this music with you this week, um, those of you who can come on Friday, and also looking forward to sharing it with you from across the ocean. Um, the website, which will have everything that's been created in the project to date, will be live this summer. And my hope is that all of the, all of the scores and all the performance materials can be available for free, can be downloaded, so that this repertory can be immediately in the hands of, of other flutists and, and of anybody who's interested in it. And, um, you know, Wen Sung, Cho Wen Sung, who was Varese's longtime assistant, often said that Varez was, was the one all alone. And uh, he, was, he was not recognized for much of his life. And the density was the one that was most alone of his pieces. It was his only solo flute piece. And my hope is through this project that um, both Varese and Density 21.5 will be in some finer company <laughs> and will not be so alone. So thank you so much for, for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your open ears. And um, have a wonderful evening. <laughs> thank you.